Good morning. <laughs> Good morning, good morning everyone. everybody. Yeah, <laughs> good morning. Okay, so I think we can we can start. Um, let's see if other people uh, keep on joining us. Uh, so um, I am Maria Bustelo. I am the uh, super A coordinator, and I would like very much to welcome all of you to this uh, web webinar engaging with external stakeholders and the innovation ecosystems while implementing a gender equality uh, plan. I would like to welcome you on behalf of the uh, uh, SuperA Consortium. And uh, of course, the first thing we want is we want to thank very much our sister uh, projects, Gender, Gender Smart and Caliper, uh, for presenting their experience and therefore uh, promoting uh, this collaboration and mutual exchange that we all aim at this kind of European structural change, uh, European projects ecosystem. Okay, um, we we are about to finalize the, to finalize uh, uh, Supera at the end of May, uh, but of course uh, the implementation of the gender equality uh, plans and equality actions keep keep on taking place uh, in all implementing partners. So uh, we really appreciate uh, uh, this uh, webinar and of course our uh, experience during this last uh, uh, four years uh, is that engaging uh, stakeholders and creating networks and alliances in a collaborative and participatory way is uh, the only not not only a good way to go but we would say the only way to go for implementing uh, good gender equality goal, uh, uh, gender equality plans. And of course, this is not only uh, for internal stakeholders, but also uh, for external ones, sometimes a good driver for enhancing internal change. So uh, thank you uh, again to all of you for being here and especially to uh, Panayota, uh, Polycarpu and from Gender Smart and uh, uh, Maria San Giuliano from uh, Caliper. So I would now very much uh, like to give the floor to Basia Matesi and Lut Mergard for facilitating the webinar. And yeah, so the floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you, Maria, for the introduction. Um, so welcome everybody to this session on a topic which is not that often paid attention to and we think it's more important to uh, to be more central in our work on gender equality plans because as maria said it can be a real leverage uh, for internal work but before we turn to uh, content i would like to just share with you a couple of housekeeping rules we would like to ask you to keep your microphones as usual muted uh, so shut at all times except when we are speaking so at the end of the session i hope we won't be too many and we will be able to manage to um, to to exchange with each other uh, while speaking during the q a the speakers will present first and the q a and exchange with the audience will come at the end but throughout the sessions feel free and please do so please add your questions in the in the chat box and we will address them uh, afterwards um, as you might have noticed and i also put it in the chat this session is being recorded. If you don't want to feature in the recording, please um, shut down or keep your cameras uh, shut. You may also change your name into initials or something if you or a pseudonym if you don't want to uh, feature with your name in the recording. So I now pass on the floor to Vasya for presenting our speakers of today. Thank you very much, Lut, and thank you very much, everyone. I'm very happy to introduce our two speakers of today. We will have uh, two presentations. 
starting with uh, Panayota Polikarpu, uh, who will present us the working with external stakeholders at CAT and her experience on gender smart. Panayota holds um, a degree in business and public administration from the University of Cyprus. Her interests focus on gender and equality, diversity and inclusion. And in 2020, she co-founded the first digital awareness campaign for gender equality in Cyprus called Fkyoloja. And furthermore, co-authored the book, a book about equality, a few words for a big change. She firmly believes in the empowerment of young girls and in December 2021, she launched a new initiative in Cyprus called uh, Girls in STEM uh, Academy, which aims to inspire the next generation of women leaders in STEM fields. Currently, she works at Cyprus University of Technology as research fellow and project manager of Gender Smart. So welcome, Panayota. And uh, on the other end, on the other uh, presentation, we have uh, Maria San Giuliano, who is the CEO and gender expert at Smart Venice. And she's here today with her capacity as scientific coordinator of the Caliper project. Uh, she has an MA in philosophy and social sciences and PhD in cognitive and learning studies. She is currently the research director and CEO of Smart Venice, an SME specialized in consulting, research, and training on gender and inclusive innovation at the territorial and organizational levels. Maria has 20 plus years of working experience on gender equality issues, mainly through EU funded action research projects across several funding programs. Uh, specifically, we can name uh, some of them on the gender in uh, research and innovation area. So she has been the scientific coordinator of the Horizon 2020 Equal ST project, and she has coordinated Smart Venice Actions as partner of the G Academy and Casper projects. And as we said, today she's uh, here with her hat of uh, the Caliper project. So without any further ado, I will give the floor to Panayota to start with her presentations. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, uh, Vasya, for the introduction. Hello, everyone. Thank you uh, uh, for the invitation. I'm now start sharing my screen. Um, I guess you can see my screen now. Yes, great. Uh, so again, super uh, team and- uh, Excuse Yelena. me, Panagiota, can you put it in present presenters mode, please? Yes. yes. Excellent, thank you. Perfect. Uh, so thank you again, Super, Super Ed team and Yellow Window for the invitation and for organizing this session. And it's my honor to be among you. As mentioned by uh, Vasya, I work at the Cyprus University of Technology here in Cyprus as uh, the project manager for Gender Smart at the university. So in view of our topic today, I will I would like to share our experience our experience at CAT. Uh, working with University of Cyprus, British Council, and Mediterranean Institute of Gender Studies. These are the three external stakeholders that we have quite experienced the last, um, uh, well, I would say one year we were have been working closely with them and uh, those collaborations led to great results. Therefore, I would like to present a bit of a background of each relationship and then, um, and then reflect on the outcomes uh, from these collaborations. So starting with the University of Cyprus, let me say that University of Cyprus is the biggest public university uh, uh, in Cyprus, then comes uh, Cyprus University of Technology. And University of Cyprus has already established a diversity and inclusion office under uh, the auspices of the rector, under the rector's office. And this happened last year. Um, I'm a graduate from the University of Cyprus, and I have promoting a lot of the work that has been going on through Gender Smart with my professors and other colleagues, and they were aware of the activities that Gender Smart has been implementing at CAT. Therefore, they reached out to us, particular Gender Smart team, asking for advice and support when it comes to designing and implementing an equality plan. That, that was um, happening before the official. Uh, guidance of, from Horizon 2022. So they were seeking from partners, local partners, to gather their experience and input when it comes to how do we conduct audit, how do we design a plan, in which areas do we focus. Therefore, we became the trustees advisors uh, for University of Cyprus. 
and we were um, advising them through the through the, through through that process. Uh, we could change a lot of um, let's say uh, ideas and practices when it comes to challenging uh, resistances when it comes to uh, what practices are better for middle and top management. And as an outcome of this collaboration that has been happening, uh, I would say constantly uh, for one year, I could say that both of team of, of the team at, at the office of the University of Cyprus and Gender Smart, both teams were boosted when it comes to motivation and understanding because um, I would say it's a challenging field to work when there are no uh, people around you doing similar jobs. So if I say it as a project manager working with this topic with a few resources at the university, having another team in an uh, allied university working in this topic boosted also my understanding on the change we're going to implement. And we uh, both experienced growth when it comes to uh the dynamic uh and we had a more a negotiation power also internally because we would refer to other the, the others university progress in order to um influence middle and top management internally for us and even though cat was the advisor in this case for Cyprus for University of Cyprus, excuse me, I will say that we as CAD uh, gathered something really important back from the University of Cyprus. And that was the improvement of our gender equality plan. We were inspired to see that the University of Cyprus chose to have some other uh, social categories in their equality plan. So they added intersectionality, they uh, added particular activities and policies when it comes to LGBTQ plus community, other minorities, disabled people. So we were inspired by them. And this uh, January in 2022, the team of Gender Smart revisited its uh, gender equality plan. And we have now submitted a new equality plan for approval when uh, intersecting, uh, including intersectionality. Therefore, I would say that was the most outstanding outcome from this collaboration, working with this uh, particular stakeholder. Moving on to the next uh, stakeholder, which is the British Council. The British Council in Cyprus um, initiated a collaboration between public and private universities. What actually happened in simple words, uh, British Council sent an email to all private and public universities that uh, they are interested to do a collaboration between all the universities uh, when it comes to equality, gender equality, internally at universities. So the British Council was, let's say, the middle person to facilitate a conversation around this topic by bringing all of us together. Well, it's not really common to have close collaborations between public and private universities in Cyprus, where a small island, so you can imagine the competition is really high. However, we may collaborate in, in projects, but not in particular um, related to uh, gender equality. So British Council brought us all together. We met each other. And for six months, we had by um, biweekly meetings, online meetings, trying to see how we can improve the current situation, let's say, when it comes to gender equality in academia. So after a lot of work and exchange of experience, we organized uh, an event uh, named Promoting Gender Equality in Cypriot Universities, as you can see, challenges and good practices. Where the idea was for the universities involved, we had an open discussion about what are the main challenges and good practices. And British Council brought some experts, experts from the UK uh, to share some good practices. And uh, the outcome of this event was to develop an advocacy document that uh, has been now finished and is going to be presented at the president of the parliament as a form of, let's say, lobbying and advocacy towards that. So we all share some challenges. Um, universities like uh, CAT and UCY, University of Cyprus, shared what they have already been doing so all these uh, were, in, were developed in the form of documents. 
And uh, we have now established a, a strong collaboration between um, private and public universities. So uh, moving now to the last stakeholder, which is the recent collaboration we had. It was with the Mediterranean Institute of Gender Studies. Just a few information about the Institute. Um, it is a leading uh, not-profit organization that promotes gender equality and women's rights in Cyprus and in the Mediterranean region. They're doing uh, great work when it comes to research training. It's a form of experts, gender experts. Um, and uh, we as university uh, reached out to them last year. Our human resources services re reached out to them, asking them to offer a training on unconscious bias uh, addressed in particular to middle and top management uh, at the university. That was an initiative coming from Gender Smart Underwork Package 4, which is um, career support measures, et cetera, et cetera. But the university then said, let's, let me do it. Let the human resources support that financially. So we aim for something bigger in the future. Therefore, it was an initiative from Gender Smart. However, it was supported internally from top management, from the top management of the university. This training happened last uh, year from summer until autumn. It was a series of focus groups and trainings, again, directly only for middle and top management. And the result of those of the training became, let's say, a consulting uh, document going back to the leadership of the university because the trainers, the trainers uh, led it to some conclusions and the trainees came up with some ideas about gender equality and inclusion. And I'm moving to the outcome of this interaction because the outcomes that I just mentioned, the results of these trainings were taken into consideration in the new equality plan of the university that was revisited this year in January. So in this way, middle and top management were trained about the conscious bias and they came up with some solutions Therefore, we took those solutions and we actually put them in the new plan. Therefore, we created ownership of the plan for middle and top management, which I would say this is um, the most, let's say, dynamic point because now they don't have uh, strong arguments to, you know, encounter those ideas as this is their, their ideas. So this, closer, this close collaboration with the Mediterranean Institute of Gender Studies uh, aimed to a new training that I skipped before. It's the upcoming training that's coming this September. We will aim to address the training on unconscious bias to the students. Now we're changing the audience. So we're planning to do that this September. And next week, we are signing a memorandum of understanding with the Institute, which I think we're the first university that uh, actually signs a memorandum of understanding with a gender expert institute in Cyprus. And this includes exchange of experiences. They will share some good practices. We will have um, also uh, the right to participate in their research and get um, first the results, let's say, in, uh, in the form of consulting. So this also, of course, adds a lot of uh, benefits to the university, not only internally, but also externally, as it creates also some credibility and commitment towards these issues, gender equality in general. And last but not least, the training that I mentioned before at the beginning on a conscious bias, it was supported by the, by the leadership, it was supported financially by the university and not gender smart, leading to making this training being part of uh, the annual trainings offered to employees. Therefore, the training has been now institutionalized and committed to be offered every year to middle and top management, maybe not only. Therefore, in, in order to sum up those experience in some key points that I would say uh, led to great results, because as mentioned before by Alut, um, the benefits of, of, of those collaborations of being extrovert and looking outside led to sub substantial and important um, points for us, not only as gender smart team, but as university. It improved our credibility working with experts and working with other universities uh, in, it improved our credibility as um, leaders towards gender equality in Cypriot universities, but also commitment from leadership when those trainings, for example, have been institutionalized. Uh, we also gather important outputs when it comes to um, exchanging experience with others. And as a result, 
we improved our own strategies and particular gender equality plan. And because we managed to involve top and uh, middle and top management through these uh, trainings, partnerships, uh, meetings, we, we minimized by a lot resistance when it comes to this topic. And last but not least, people who were not enabled uh, before um, as players, as important uh, uh, change makers, have now understood the importance of, of uh, being in the, in the front line uh, towards change through all these small actions and achievements. Uh, therefore, I would like to keep it um, short and uh, until now, I hope I'm, I'm within my time limit. And I look forward for your questions after all. Of course, I remain at your disposal. If you would like to discuss anything further later, please feel free, you, feel free to use my email. Thank you. Thanks, Panagiota. You have no problem with time whatsoever. <laughs> so, um, thank you. We will now pass the floor to uh, Maria San Giuliano. We look forward to hearing from you. Yes, thank you, Lut. I'm trying to, uh, I'm sharing my screen and from the beginning. Can you see it properly now? Not in presenter's mode, but you see it. Mm -hmm. Yes, now, now yes, it's so good. Perfect. It's good, okay. Then, um, uh, good morning, everybody, on the first place. Uh, thank you to the Supera meeting, to the Supera project and to Yellow Window for inviting uh, me and the Caliper project to, to share uh, on this uh, very important uh, topic. So basically, um, uh, I was asked you to present um, our, our approach uh, to the um, institutional change uh, processes and job design and implementation in Caliper that is relying on um, a quadruple helix um, uh, innovation ecosystems uh, exchange uh, embedded into the concept of the project. Um, we are a consortium uh, of um, uh, two supporting organizations uh, so we have uh, Vilabs as coordinators, we are uh, the scientific coordinators, and we have uh, nine uh, research organizations implementing institutional change processes, seven RPOs and two RFOs. I have seen in the chat box that we, we have few uh, partners uh, participating today, uh, so it would be also good to hear from, uh, from them. Uh, so, um, Already in the design uh, phase uh, of Caliper, uh, we have uh, made uh, quite a specific uh, choice, um, con conceptualizing and uh, structuring the project uh, as, um, as it says, the, the subtitle uh, of the project itself, um, linking research and innovation. So connecting inward institutional change with outward um, uh, collaboration um, as, a, as a strategy. We wanted to uh, explore uh, opportunities uh, of this. Clearly, the, um, let's say, underlying hypothesis is that there are opportunities. Uh, we are trying to do so also in an awareness of the pot potential, uh, let's say, uh, risks that are embedded. Uh, but um, the uh, assumptions that we um, uh, we, take in, we took into consideration when doing so um, uh, were uh, taken from uh, existing uh, studies on gender innovation and feminist studies on innovation. So we considered that uh, the challenges that the universities and research organizations are facing are also shared at a broader level by many uh, uh, actors and other institutions at the innovation ecosystems, both in terms of um, unbalanced uh, gender plus uh, representation in uh, particularly in STEM fields, both uh, in research and uh, in uh, innovation in the sense of um, uh, low uh, rates of um, uh, women among uh, and minority uh, people uh, uh, among those who uh, register uh, 
patents out of uh, the results of scientific research and also um, uh, low rates of um, uh, women as um, uh, leaders in uh, innovative uh, startups and businesses. Uh, this is also uh, the case, um, gender bias is also featuring uh, innovation processes, so um, the way uh, innovation is conceptualized, uh, the way it is meant, mostly with a tech, predominantly uh, tech orientation, so disregarding uh, social innovation, um, process-related innovation, so keeping um, uh, bigger um, um, let's say, uh, providing um, much more attention to product innovation, for example, than process, and so on and so forth. And this translates into uh, funding choices uh, as well, so as also very concrete uh, repercussions. Uh, and it translates, translates also into exclusive dynamics within ecosystems. So, um, who is considered as part of innovation ecosystems. We made since the very beginning a broad choice. So we meant um, uh, to be inclusive in the definition of ecosystems itself. Uh, itself uh, and we also wanted to uh, take into consideration uh, how gender uh, is not taken into consideration in the content of uh, innovation, so into product design, into tech design, into, into um, uh, service and, and, and uh, process uh, design within innovation. Uh, so um, Caliper so has tried really, and we are currently uh, doing it, um, to integrate uh, this type of perspective, so merging inward and outward um, change um, across all the main project phases and tools uh, from the um, in very initial steps, um, so uh, um, scoping and framing through an initial study, um, assessment um, within the research uh, organizations, and the way we have uh, constructed assessment methodologies, the JEP design phase um, organized uh, with a, a, a co-creation process engaging external stakeholders and um, the JEP design itself and its impl implementation, uh, meaning that we have included uh, collaborative actions uh, with external stakeholders already in the JEP, in the JEP's design and also monitoring and uh, evaluation. Um, uh, to accompany this, um, we are uh, also um, working on uh, capacity building and learning activities uh, for the consortium uh, with the engage engagement of uh, other uh, sister projects. Uh, and this is really a transversal uh, element that, uh, that because it's quite a, quite a new, I would say, uh, approach, and there is a lot to learn uh, also from from others um, and and from 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 other institutional change um, uh, projects. So we have begun with a scoping and framing study. This has has, has really. Um, looked into the policy developments, uh, into the uh, literature on gender bias uh, in, in innovation uh, processes. Um, we have researched um, through in-depth interviews on nine good practices uh, and examples of collaborative actions uh, for gender equality that tries to uh, uh, work in parallel and in conjunction on internal institutional change while uh, promoting collaboration with external stakeholders. We have uh, held focus groups with 15 experts, also from the Supera project and many other, other uh, sister projects, reflecting, um, initiating um, a joint reflection on opportunities and challenges of this type of approach. This uh, has um, uh, fed into a, a report uh, that is, uh, as all the other um, caliper deliverable, deliverables uh, already available on Zenodo, on the Zenodo page of the project. Um, and uh, here we have really focused on our 
uh, quadruple helix approach to innovation ecosystem. So uh, we know that sometimes uh, when, uh, when we refer to innovation ecosystem, there is a tendency to uh, identify this uh, as um, identify this as um, mostly a business sector and um, uh, public government uh, sector. Uh, and we, while on the other hand, uh, based on um, uh, the, the existing uh, critique to this approach coming from uh, gender, um, uh, gender and innovation studies, we have uh, expanded the vision to include uh, NGOs, civil society, and in particular, uh, women's NGOs uh, and feminist um, organizations. But at the, on the other side, we have really tried to look, look at all the other uh, quadruple helix nodes uh, with a gender perspective. So trying to understand uh, which um, networks um, within each type of organizations are already existing of individuals and of um, and among organizations that are um, working on gender equality issues throughout. Um, so uh, adopting this approach uh, has changed the way um, uh, we uh, perform the initial assessment on gender uh, on gender equality. And uh, I would say uh, has expanded the scope of such an assessment. In particular, um, we have um, included in the assessment internal assessment methodology uh, an, an area that uh, usually um, is not um, taken into account, that is uh, uh, looking at gender uh, gaps into um, transfer to market, um, transfer of scientific uh, research results to market and to society. That is um, an area um, universities are increasingly uh, active in. And a third mission. So another um, set of uh, sectors and units that look at um, you know, uh, citizen science uh, and, and um, in general promoting um, collaborations with, with uh, outward stakeholders. Uh, so here we have a lot, we have considered uh, these um, three types of, of, of um, indicators, qualitative indicators included in the assessment methodology. So the presence of collaborative research projects with a gender dimension in the content of research and tech development, uh, existing exi existence of measures uh, on um, gender uh, on on. Um, on gender in the uh, transfer to market and uh, on science communication uh, with a gender uh, component. Um, so uh, this has turned out uh, into uh, also uh, an assessment methodology with um, uh, an extra chapter. Uh, so all the Caliper partners uh, have also assessed the uh, their um, uh, their respective regional and national ecosystems. On one hand, um, via a context analysis on national uh, legal and policy frameworks, so the regulations, the policy trends, the funding opportunities, uh, the um, opportunities for strategic policy framing, and on the other hand, a real mapping of the stakeholders uh, with, with the already uh, referred to quadruple helix approach. Uh, also with an exploration of um, their openness and their uh, activism uh, on uh, gender equality issues clearly, because uh, we have tried to promote uh, focused collaboration. Um, in terms of process, um, uh, we have um, shifted from a context analysis through desk research interviews uh, and contacts with internal stakeholders for retrieving information and data to mapping. Uh, the mapping of the uh, ecosystems have been conducted, conducted through focus groups with internal stakeholders, uh, a survey for um, uh, external stakeholders, uh, and then uh, a social network uh, analysis. 
Um, and the ultimate goal of this in Caliper was to create so-called research and innovation apps of selected uh, organizations uh, that were um, uh, interested and available into being engaged in a co-creation process and uh, to set up um, collaborative actions within the JEPS. And this has happened at each individual uh, RPO and uh, RFO. Uh, so uh, with this picture, I wanted to give you a bit of a glimpse on uh, uh, some findings that came from the social network analysis that, that the partners performed, uh, looking at their existing collaborations so this this is from one uh, of of the partners just to give you an example is i mean uh, we discovered in several cases uh, not all of them but uh, in several cases we discovered some gendered patterns in um, in the uh, leadership of uh, collaborations with external stakeholders so here the maps uh, shows the um uh, the existing uh, networks and collaborations with other stakeholders. The yellow uh, dots um, represent uh, those collaborations that are um, led by women. Um, and uh, from uh, left to right, we have first um, collaborations with uh, academic partners and universities. Then we move uh, to industry and business. Uh, the second row uh, includes uh, government and public sector, civil society and schools. Uh, the last one is collaborations with schools. Uh, you can see really how, um, where there is, I would say, less power uh, and probably less funds allocated. Uh, the, uh, in, this, in this case, the, the uh leadership from women is is uh, almost exclusive uh while um much less the case in collaborations with uh, other universities uh probably uh also very much more research oriented and with industry and business and same for for the um uh, even 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 worse for the collaborations with uh government and public sector and surprisingly a bit uh, civil society. Uh, the, we were also meaning to, uh, intending to um, map uh, those collaborations which had uh, a gender component in the content. Um, uh, and in this case, uh, none of the existing collaborations was marked uh, with these features. So this in a way showed that uh, uh, there is work to be done. Um, the external assessment methodology has also uh, comprised this set of indicators um, to look at, um, uh, at this, these aspects, uh, both in talents and workforce uh, education and acquisitions, uh, in terms of leadership, uh, knowledge and tech production issues, um, and uh, broader issues featuring uh, research and innovation um, culture. So I, I won't go through all the different uh, set of indicators on clearly on, uh, I mean, uh, data collection has been quite challenging uh, because the availability of data uh, and uh, on, on all these, these uh, areas and particular aspects um, uh, was uh, something uh, uh, that uh, was was quite uh, quite challenging in many cases, uh, but this has also um, led partners to um, uh, point at the need for uh, changing um, uh, data collection processes and and uh, methods as well. Uh, so the process has continued uh, then, uh, as I already anticipated, uh, after the mapping um, uh, with um, a co-creation process. So a selected number of um, external stakeholders have, has been engaged in uh, um, strategic 
uh, change uh, scenarios workshops uh, that were meant uh, as uh, multi-stakeholder dialogues organized by each partner uh, where the key results from the assessment, um, internal and external assessments, but mostly then the, the external assessments uh, were shared, um, common challenges and common possible opportunities were um, uh, identified, um, and uh, also uh, some possible collaborative actions uh, started to take shape uh, within these uh, co-creation workshops. Um, so, um, in the nine jets uh, of the uh, Caliper partners, uh, we ended up having uh, 42 collaborative actions, uh, engaging in total 176 uh, stakeholders. Here you, you can see in this chart, uh, um, we, are, we are listing the, um, the key uh, areas. Um, uh, we name these uh, implementation areas um, uh, that that we use in the Caliper uh, uh, project to uh, let's say uh, systematize uh, and cluster the different uh, type of measures and JEPS activities. And you can see that most of the uh, collaborative actions with external stakeholders were focused uh, on uh, communication. Uh, then uh, integration of gender uh, into the content of research, but also um, uh, HR, uh, sexual harassment, and uh, student services. A bit less on transfer to market and teaching. Um, some examples, a few examples of collaborative actions um, uh, in terms of uh, integration of uh, the gender dimension in the content of scientific research and innovation. We have joint um, guidelines on uh, the integration of uh, gender in research. Uh, we have some uh, collaborative research projects, uh, award and prizes uh, for female scientists, uh, the ev evaluation criteria for future goals, particularly uh, from the side of um, uh, research funding organizations. Um, in human resources, um, some uh, RPOs uh, have worked together with other RPOs uh, on um, uh, common recruitment protocols and measures to avoid bias. Uh, there are uh, several um, raising awareness uh, and networking events that are part of the JEPs and uh, that are um, actively uh, engaging other external stakeholders, trainings on sexual harassment, uh, training and raising, raising activities on sexual harassment and gender-based violence, um, uh, a monitoring system on how uh, women uh, are um, uh, participating in transfer to market activities um, done in collaboration with external st stakeholders, uh, win events uh, that are, um, let's say, uh, communication and dissemination events that all partners uh, are going to organize uh, with a selection of uh, external stakeholders. It stands for women in innovation events. And then student services, um, uh, that are and activities that are um, um, targeting both uh, prospective students and existing students. Um, what I can say is that uh, now we are in Caliper in the first year of implementation, and time wise, uh, most of the collaborative actions uh, have been placed in the, uh, in the second implementation round. So we don't have um, results uh, now on how the collaborative actions are actually uh, functioning. Um, I, I think it was, um, I mean, it was um, uh, a choice to start the first implementation phase on internal collaboration, internal uh, institutional change and uh, take some further time uh, in the second implementation for uh, leveraging on collaborative actions. Uh, the, the stakeholders that are engaged. Um, so uh, the two pie charts show uh, the difference uh, between uh, the uh, co-creation phase and the um, uh, 
uh, actual engagement into uh, collaborative actions that are in the JETS. Uh, so initially, uh, there was, um, uh, you, you, you can see here how the um, uh, share of academic partners uh, has increased uh, in the process, uh, while uh, the share of uh, business and industry partners uh, has diminished a bit. Uh, when it uh, then um, came to the point of uh, taking action together. Uh, and at the same time, also the public sector increased and there was uh, a greater engagement of uh, civil society and uh, um, yeah, the civil society uh, in particular. Uh, yeah, and uh, to be noted how uh, most of the participants to the co-creation sessions coming from external stakeholders were female. No surprise, I would say. So uh, in terms of the um, emerging trends and commonalities, um, what we um, tend to see as for now, looking at the actions that are included in the JEPS, is that um, actions with research and um, within uh, the research and teaching areas tend um, also not surprisingly to uh, engage mostly with the with uh, partners and stakeholders from academic sectors uh, those in under transfer to market and human resources on the other hand uh, tend to engage uh, both academic uh, stakeholders and uh, entities from the business sectors um, while uh, in terms of communication and sexual harassment, uh, there is, um, uh, a, let's say, a broader uh, type of uh, um, collaboration, uh, and the same also uh, for uh, student services. Uh, civil society is mostly engaged within these uh, areas. Um, and we have also um, noted how in several cases, the partners tend to look uh, at civil society stakeholders uh, for getting input also on intersectionality, on how to embed uh, an intersectional approach into their jobs. Uh, finally, and I close, um, we are um, uh, obviously uh, adopting a same um, perspective in the making of uh, monitoring and evaluation of the JEPS. Um, um, the, the monitoring and evaluation methodology that we developed uh, with uh, FUOC uh, uh, is based on uh, the theory of change from the F40 model. Uh, and takes into account uh, potentials, uh, also the potential risks uh, of an approach that leverages on external collaboration. Um, so, uh, in the money, in the formative evaluation, uh, each action uh, um, and and each uh, measure is identified as collaborative or not. And in any case, collaboration with external stakeholders is. Uh, subject of the uh, reporting uh, process across all actions. And then in the summative evaluation, at the end of the um, second round of implementation, we are going to prioritize the assessment of how the overall uh, creation of the hubs uh, has worked uh, and the state of collaboration uh, across the four quad quadruple helix uh, sectors. Uh, we will uh, assess the, uh, to which degree a shared agenda and shared priorities on gender equality among the innovation ecosystem stakeholders has been established, uh, but also uh, what challenges and synergies uh, this has um, you know, produced, um, what influence and contribution the hubs have, have provided to in, internal, intra-organizational job design and implementation, what level of awareness uh, from the uh, hubs uh, members on uh, the importance of uh, gender in uh, research and innovation uh, and the contribution of this to the sustainability and these synergistic effects. 
um, and this is really uh, all to come. As for now, we see many of the of the uh, positive aspects that have been recalled uh, by Panagiota uh, really happening in terms of leveraging the motivation, boosting the um, the credibility of JEP uh, actions, um, particularly um, when when trying to engage. Um, middle and 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 uh, top management uh, that are quite sensitive to this level of collaborations with with external stakeholders on the other hand uh, this um, uh, of course takes efforts and time uh, so the efforts have, have really to be very carefully balanced uh, in in the in the whole uh, process um, we can share more uh, in the Q&A, and as for now, um, I thank you for your attention and welcome your, your questions and notes. Thanks a lot, Maria. Definitely a challenging undertaking and also innovative in the approach. Uh, if you look at sister projects, this is really a, a, a different, a distinct approach to, uh, to implementing institutional change. So we have not received questions in the chat yet. So feel free, everybody, to either type your questions in the chat or use the raise your hand function, which is at the bottom of your screen, if you want to take the floor, in which case I would like to ask you first to present yourself make clear to whom of the speakers you address your question and then uh, pose your question. But while we are waiting for any questions to arise, I have a question myself for both of you. In fact, you I had the impression you were trying to navigate a bit around the challenges, but could you expand maybe a bit on what are the challenges that you experienced in these cooperations and maybe also to what extent this has been weighing on the core team or not so is that somehow distracting the core team from the internal institutional change work or not it could also be on the contrary it could have been feeding the internal institutional change work so what are your perspectives on that so maybe i will start with pan i see you are still thinking deeply about my question but i will give the floor first to you Yes, of course. Um, first of all, uh, Maria, thank you for your insightful um, presentation. It was really inspiring. Uh, to be honest, I was keeping notes all the time because I could see a more, I wouldn't say a scientific approach, but more um, institutional approach when it comes to implementing change towards that. So uh, really, I, I was impressed and thank you for, for this. Uh, now answering a good question. Um, to be honest, um, as you can tell, our, our, our activities were more limited uh, to specific actions and um, the challenges were coming perhaps from leadership in a way how this will look for the university to collaborate with this and this. So it was the fear, let's say, of going outside the book or looking outside the university that prevents us from um, from actually implementing uh, collaborations with externals. But that was, I think, a culture, a small culture change that was dealt easily. I wouldn't say it led to um, resistance or, or challenge. That's why I was thinking, I was trying to go deeper to actually find something more substantial. But uh, that, that comes to my mind right now. I don't know, maybe if I hear Maria, maybe something else would come up, but I, I can, I can uh, continue later. Maria? Yeah, um, that's, a, that's a good question indeed. Um, I think that um, there is a trade-off between the uh, opportunities that are there and the, uh, let's say, leveraging uh, potentials of uh, um, uh, undertaking um, this inward-outward approach. Um, and the and the risks that are uh, in a way um, uh, uh, I would say uh, also um, 
related to this distract potentially distracting effects yeah. that you that you name uh definitely i think this this is this is definitely there um but as i mentioned uh, i be, i really believe it's a matter of uh finding a good balance uh, for example, in, in Caliper, uh, we had this um, initial um, uh, sort of uh, implicit understanding that the, uh, the hubs would need to um, function as sort of semi-permanent networks uh, to be engaged with uh, at all time. Uh, but um, along the process, we uh, adopted really a more focused approach, uh, meaning uh, we start up, we start a co-creation uh, process where several type of stakeholders are engaged together. But then we go for uh, really uh, more focused and more action-oriented collaborations. We don't convene all the network partners um, in a constant way uh, that would uh, take a lot of efforts and possibly the attention away for, for, from, from other, uh, let's say, uh, internal institutional change um, aspects. Uh, but we really um, keep it much more focused and by the end of the project we are going to uh, once the implementation is finished, to also uh, uh, elaborate a charter uh, on gender responsive innovation ecosystems with the hubs, uh, and this will, uh, will let's say, broaden up uh, the scope again. I, I, I think that another, uh, another um, you know, you, Panagiotta, you mentioned the expertise uh, element that is very important. Uh, because there is this learning component at stake when it comes to collaborating uh, with, with other uh, entities. Uh, so universities engaged in JEP implementation, they uh, look for expertise outward, uh, but they can also then uh, quite quickly uh, become experts, at, uh, be identified as experts at the territorial level. And I think that um, uh, when uh, we, we observed uh, in the recent years this combined effect uh, due to the Horizon Europe requirement uh, that uh, has to be in a way um, contained and a bit uh, limited, I would say, uh, because um, the, the, the Horizon Europe eligibility criteria has dynamized the, the, the environment a lot and, all the, and many of the external stakeholders uh, that are engaged in the apps and that are research organizations, they now look at the, the partners as uh, the experts and they want, you know, uh, <laughs> um, uh, efforts to be placed to, uh, to, to consult, to advise, to, uh, and this is to be, um, in a way, uh, taken uh, uh, under control, I would say, not to, to disperse the efforts. Anything you would like to add, Panagiotta? No, uh, actually, um, I like I realized that there are more perspectives to see uh, the approach of uh, inviting and collaborating with external stakeholders. And there are different dynamics that uh, partners can, they can have leverage to uh, exactly gain on that expertise that is expected usually sometimes. Um, no, no, nothing, nothing further, I would say. Thanks. I want to pick up one of the elements that Maria was saying, so um, uh, relating to the expectations of the stakeholders. And so I would think that the purpose of such collaborations that are sold should be a win-win for both parties or the, the different parties involved. So if the others are mostly expecting to be at the receiving end of expertise, there might be an imbalance in the relationship. So this is, I think, what needs to be 
managed, but this also relates to, I think, the depth of the actions that can be undertaken together. Because based on what I saw in your slide, Maria, I was thinking that to some extent this may not be the really transformative activities that are pursued first. And if they are, this means that also the other actors are involving resources. So while the Caliper partners are doing this with the budget of the European Commission and the project, the others will have to come up with their own resources. So how are these different interests um, handled and considered discussed in these collaborative platforms in Caliper, Maria? Uh, yeah, the resources um, component is, uh, I think it's, it's, it's also crucial. I remember that it was actually um, mentioned by uh, uh, by by several partners within the um, um, within the uh, project meetings and all the bilateral uh, sessions that we that we have to accompany them throughout the project. So it's about um, looking at what could be the incentives uh, from both sides. From, for what you uh, rightly describe as a win-win uh, type of collaboration. Um, I think that um, several collaborations also are also driven by um, uh, the creating further opportunities for uh, joint applications in um, regional development funds, uh, the uh, now the recovery and, and resilience plans and so on and so forth. Um, because clearly everybody is very much resource aware and uh, and this can can become um, can become a challenge. Then to your other note on the type of actions, um, uh, yeah, uh, we will make a final, um, also a final assessment um, on whether uh, the um, collaborative actions, this will be very interesting to look at, to what extent then the collaborations will be transformative, to what extent the, the collaborative actions will be positioned more uh, towards soft type of measures um yeah but but um and then also what what impacts on on um let's say uh, sustainability and exploitation so what further collaborations uh have been uh leveraged starting from implementing those measures uh these were will be will all be interesting uh, aspects to uh, to look at <clears throat> Uh, let's Thank you. Yes, yes, I realized. <laughs> Thank you. We have a question in the chat from Cindy van Gifte. Maybe Cindy, you can unmute yourself or do you prefer I read it? I, I can unmute indeed. Yes. Yeah, I had a question. Um, thank you very much to the two speakers. Very interesting dialogues. And I had a question to Maria. Um, I really was um, questioning whether this outward change approach that you've uh, been explaining, whether you had foreseen this as of start in the concept of your project that you submitted to the European Commission, or whether this is a type of, of uh, exchanges with uh, external uh, stakeholders, uh, this dimension, or have, have you added this throughout the project, as you saw really an added value of this uh, because as as you're at, we are also in this type of of project, and I I can imagine that uh, when you are a beginner in gender equality and you have to start and initiate these multiple dialogues internally and externally, that this can feel really a, a bit overwhelming, um, and that we might uh, lose priorities and maybe then as well maybe go less quick here on on certain changes. Well, this is a question and, and a remark. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, Cindy, for the question. Um, it was, uh, it was uh, the project approach since the very beginning, so since the design phase. Uh, 
we we conceptualize it in in precisely uh, with this feature. So I mean, we didn't know at that time how we are we would be then. Uh, design the assessment methodology in a particular way uh, to, uh, to, to respond to this approach. Mm, we, we didn't have the set of indicators uh, clear at the beginning, uh, but for example, we, uh, but, but, um, uh, we, um, we, it, what was foreseen since from scratch was uh, the um, initial co-creation processes and the uh, creation of the uh, research and innovation apps and the collaborative actions. So yeah, it was it was preset. Um, I, I would say that that overall uh, and as for now um, the the advantages seems uh, more than the than the risks um, because particularly in this first phase uh, in the in the first um, let's say uh, assessment and and design phase and that design phase uh, it was uh, there was a lot of uh, effort uh, for uh, uh, gaining a full commitment uh, from uh, leadership at the organizations uh, and middle management and the argument that uh, uh, this um, outward oriented approach to institutional change would um, uh, let's say uh, enhance the uh, the research organization uh, credibility and um, position also in this uh, broad network of relations uh, was functioning, well, functioning well uh, to get the uh, attention and the commitment of the um, top and middle management. Um, yeah, now, of course, uh, uh, did, we had the COVID-19 pandemic impact slowing down everything. Uh, in general, we experienced, I think, as most of the other sister projects, this deep prioritization of, gen of the gender equality agenda uh, due also to pandemics uh, and the crisis it generated. Uh, so uh, the process was um, a bit slowed down, but overall, uh, things are, are progressing and on track. Uh, so I'm very optimistic to that respect. And Panagiotta, do you experience within your university an additional or an increased appetite, in fact, for seeking cooperations following these positive experiences? Or is this something that is now pursued more actively? Or would you think that leadership or other stakeholders are now more open to these collaborations? Yes, definitely. It made a lot of impact, not only because we managed to institutionalize some of those actions, but also because we took them to the different level when it comes to the signature of the memorandum of understanding. So the leadership, um, I, I can tell that it uh, interprets those actions as a form of commitment. Therefore, with recent, for example, uh, interactions I had with the rector of the university, for the first time ever, he asked me what's next, what activities are coming, what we should do. So you could see that the attention have been now shifted towards setting those priorities, um, those, those tasks into priority. And uh, in a way, in long term, I see that I, I can tell that the result will be more and more in a, uh, positive. Yeah. Thanks, and I have an additional question for Maria as well. I saw in your slide that you categorized the research funding organizations in the box of the academ academia and universities and not in the public sector. So I would like hesitate where to put them because they are a bit floating or they belong in both boxes. Um, is there not a particular need for cooperations or a 
specific dynamic between the RPOs and the RFOs, because in the other projects, we notice that there is clear demand, especially at the side of the RFOs, to have more uh, connections with their RPO constituency and to have also more input in terms of what expectations the RPOs have towards the RFOs. So how is that playing out in Caliper? Is that like a dedicated or a specific channel or is that part of the other coll collaborations? And Maria, I will give the floor to you immediately afterwards. Uh, yeah, no, thank you for your note. That's that's uh, that's true. Um, they, they can really be be categorized both ways. Um, we have two dif very different type types, I would say, of uh, R RFOs, but I acknowledge uh, your 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 note in the sense that it's clearly for, for them, the the uh, immediate constituency and the external stakeholders uh, are mostly um, uh, research performing organizations. Uh, and that's particularly the case, uh, I think, for our Georgian partners. Um, the the uh, our Romanian partners uh, instead uh, they have an, a different approach. With I mean they play their role as research funding also very much proactively uh, towards uh, let's say innovation ecosystems. They have uh, innovation cafes. They already had all this type of. Um, uh, collaborative settings engaging with business sector engaging and, and I see that they are also very active in um, bringing on board uh, NGOs uh, with with their expertise and their knowledge uh, under under several respects. So it probably depends also on the on the policies of individual RFOs. That's my impression. Thanks, Maria. Bustelo, I mean. <laughs> yes, thank you so much. Thank you for these very you know, wonderful and, and, and very inspiring presentations. This is just a, like a very basic uh, um, uh, question and something that I have been uh, reflecting on the on the difficulties or the not not only the difficulties but the the framework about working with external uh, stakeholders. And this is if you have noticed in your uh, consortiums that uh, the size of the uh, RPO and the university can be uh, can be um, a, a, an important variable to take into account. I'm just thinking, for example, um, my university, UCM, is such a big university that it is uh, really much more difficult to think about external uh, uh, stakeholders because everything is inside right so 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 you tend to, to have this and i imagine that uh, uh, smaller rpos um can have take uh, more rapidly the advantage of being in a in a in a small uh, in a smaller ecosystem so it's just a question if if you are uh, okay if you are um if you have noticed something like that or or you think that it's more difficult or not or yeah thank you So who is your question addressed, Maria? To both of them. Sorry. Uh, yeah, to both of them, because they are both in, in, in consortium, so, so they have uh, experience with different uh, RPOs. Yeah. Um. Uh, I have some difficulty answering that because I'm coming from a really small university, coming from a really small country. And I learned that I will say collaborations are easily to be established. And I don't have much experience when it comes to what happens, for example, in a university like in Central Europe. And Cindy is also here from our consortium. Maybe she can help me when it comes. However, going back to the consortium now um, level, um, perhaps I'm not the ideal person to answer on behalf of partners for managing bigger organizations. I, I'm sorry, I know this is not the answer that you may have been looking for. But at least from my side, I don't know how this will work in a bigger scale organizations. Yeah. Maybe Maria will give a better answer than me. Um, yeah, it's, it's an interesting question. Um, and 
I mean, I think it's an indicator for us to be monitored in the process, definitely. Um, as for now, uh, I don't really see, I can't see a big difference um, and in terms of impact. Uh, if I try to compare the uh, partners, uh, not, not as for now, but, but we, will, uh, we will take this indicator into account. I think that um, one variable can be the uh, that's also maybe uh, connected to the to the size of the institution um, is uh, uh, the existence or non-existence uh, of um, internal cross-disciplinary and cross-sectoral gender expertise. Uh, this might be depending on the size of the of the university uh, or not, but probably in most cases, yes. I think this is also driving the search for and uh, the motivation towards external collaboration. Um, because clearly, if you have uh, a lot of gender expertise in social sciences, political sciences, uh, STS studies, uh, gender and innovation, etc., you would probably tend to internalize. You wouldn't feel so much this this uh, drive for for uh, collaboration. Uh, but then, of course, there is also the other element of the uh, need to attract funds no uh, that can pose different challenges and be a driver in different ways for bigger and smaller universities so um yeah uh, we will um i i don't have uh, let's say uh, data on this yet but uh, we'll definitely um, take it into account Apart from size of the university, don't you think it's also dependent on how this workload is managed within the team of change agents and the JEP team itself? So is this a responsibility that is assigned to one particular person or to a couple of persons that do not have then other responsibilities in terms of institutional change internally for example it could be somebody who is um, mobilized from the public relations unit or from the technology transfer office if these exist so we have already a number of leads maybe uh, in terms of contacts for engaging stakeholders from beyond the institution itself so dependent on how to what extent i mean the jep team can mobilize other internal persons that can be resource persons for these collaborations so how is this going maria uh, yeah i think that um uh this is um, clearly we established uh, from scratch the the uh, JEP working groups um, and and uh, um, we um, the, the partners um, engaged also uh, colleagues from the from the uh, from sectors that that deal uh, with external collaborations. Um, but then um, the, we, we, we see the trend that I think it's quite typical in most of the institutional change uh, projects. Um, the driving team is the, the project team, right? Also in terms of change agents. Um, and uh, in that sense, uh, they are in most of the cases uh, from e either uh, research staff, academic staff, yeah, uh, supported by, uh, um, let's say, key components in the in the JEP working groups are still um, from uh, HR um, sectors um, and uh, research offices. Yeah, so. Um, but that's another uh, important uh, 
aspect right, that I think would uh, would would impact uh, at the end. To what extent the um, let's say staff members who are leading uh, external collaboration um, become uh, change agents into into active change agents into the into the process. Another variable to be monitored. Yeah, <laughs> we will be looking at your project with much uh, interest and following what your outputs will be to uh, to learn from it. End so, of 2023. Okay, okay. <laughs> we won't run away. We will we will keep an eye on you. Uh, thanks a lot for your contributions. I will do a last call on the audience if there is uh, if there are more questions to be asked, and if not, we can close this exchange. But before that, we have a, num a couple of minutes left. My colleague Vasia will drop in the chat box the link to our exit questionnaire. We would really appreciate your contribution. It's only asks a couple of your couple of minutes of your time to complete this questionnaire and then we will uh, learn from what we can do better and what your other interests are for future sessions so both speakers thank you very much for your time for your interesting perspectives on this topic of um, external collaborations so thank i will you. We will leave the session open a couple of minutes to uh, allow those who have not yet accessed the link to do it, and then we will close it. Thank you. Have a nice afternoon and a good weekend, too. Bye. bye, -bye. Thank you so much, everyone. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. bye. I get off my bye, everyone. Bye-bye. <laughs> bye. Bye-bye.